before we get started? Boy, did you all get quiet. Well, did everybody have a good Easter? Yes, Woo! God was good to Grandview, wasn't he? Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you make welcome? My, my wife. <laughs> Tony, we can bring me way down. Good to see you today. God bless you. Let's start out in prayer. And uh, I'm so happy that you're here. I've been looking forward to this with Debbie all week. And God's going to do great things tonight. Are you ready for it? Did you come with expectation? I know you did. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you, Father God, that the Holy Spirit is alive on the inside of us and we are going to just have our, our heart expanded tonight with vision and dreams and the possibilities. And I thank you, Lord God, that you're going to give us strategies on how to achieve all of our dreams. Lord, you have given each and every one of us a God-given purpose. We have our own purpose written on the tables of our heart, given by you. And Lord, we just need the strategy to see them come to pass. And I thank you. It's not hard. It's doable. And we're going to do it. Amen. Every one of us, we're going to do it, Lord. And you're going to receive the glory for it in Jesus' holy name. And we say amen and amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> amen. Turn to your other neighbor and say, I've been saving a seat for you all night long. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. Okay, I think a good way to start, since this is week three, is just to go back a little bit. Did anybody bring the last couple of weeks' notes with you? Good for you. God bless you. Hey, let's go back to week one if you have your notes with you. If not, no problem. I'll just kind of point out a couple of things, but let's kind of renew our thinking and our, our remembrance, remembrances of it. In week one, we talked about the essential nature of making goals in your life because you already have purpose. It's in your heart. And maybe you don't know what it is yet, but the Holy Spirit will reveal it to you if you ask Him. And then how do we get those things? Well, we live by strategy. Jesus lived by strategy. And we have goal setting. And once you set a goal, everything changes. When you set a goal in your life, everything changes. And uh, when you write that goal down, that's when that goal becomes reality in your life. So in the first week, we learn strategic li living. We learn that goals are essential. And we learn the seven steps of goal setting. Number one defining what you want. And you have to be specific. can't be general about it. Number two, writing it down. Number three, assigning a timeline for achievement. Number four, making a list of everything that you must do to achieve your goal. Number five, organizing your list into a plan by priority and sequence. Number six, taking action on that plan immediately. And number seven, resolving to do something about it every single day. And everybody said amen and amen. Now, let me ask you, is there anybody who would voluntarily say by testimony, I've started to rethink, that. I've started to reorder my thinking. I've started to look at things a little bit differently. And uh, I can see the value of setting goals in my life. Anybody, would you testify to that? All right, Miss Carol back there. Anybody else see the value in goal setting? Praise the Lord. Are you getting it? Are is they it going to starting give the testimony? Yeah, go ahead. Is, is it starting to uh, stir your heart and stir your mind that you're starting to think like a goal setter? Yes. Um, yes, I ended up like doing the, the writing it down. Yeah. I got a vision board and I, I have pictures that I can look at every day. Every day. Praise the Lord. Yes. Good for you. Vision board. Has anybody else gotten a journal and started to make entries in a journal? I see some hands going up. 
Does anybody see the value in writing your goals down? Amen. Anybody want to give the Lord a praise over that? Yes, I've written my goals down. Anybody want to share anything? Praise the Lord. The difference it's making? It does. It truly does. When you write it down, it becomes real in your life. So that's pretty much what week one was about. Week two, flipping over, week two was all about staying in the game. Week two was about being relentless because there's going to be a lot of things that challenge your goals. And mostly it's going to be challenges against your time. You manage your life by managing your day. Time management and goal achievement go hand in hand. It is all about taking control over your day. Every single one of us gets 24 hours. A lot of times we waste it. We want to make the most of it. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Amen. And here's the thing. We, seem to, we tend to think that we make more out of the day than we do. But if we went back and traced the hours, we'd realize we did not make as much as we possibly could. So we have to be very strategic, and we have to think, is this something I really need to do? Is this what I'm getting ready to do, will it help me on the path to achieving my goal? Because you are a goal setter, and you're a dream achiever, and there's a lot of things you could be doing, but there's a lot of things you shouldn't be doing because you want to focus on your goal. Amen. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Remember, if you want to achieve what you have never achieved before, you have to become a person that you've never been before. And so if you want to achieve, you have to become. And this is, this is what this whole thing about, is about, is the becoming part. I am becoming a goal setter. I am becoming a dream achiever. Why? Because you don't want to get at the end of the race and realize I just didn't do everything God put in my heart. Amen. Come on. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So week two was all about being relentless, staying in the game, sticking with it, don't give up, time management, making the most of your time, uh, never quitting, overcoming the obstacles, having the ant philosophy of uh, preparing not being denied, preparing a season ahead to when you're in the good times, preparing for the tough times when you're in the tough times, looking forward to the good times and, and so on and so forth. So it was all about don't quitting and then about taking the long view. If you're a goal setter, you've got to get over the idea of instant grat gratification. Those who achieve their goals have a long view of life. It may not be today that your goal comes to pass, but you're going to do something today on the road to it. And everybody said amen. amen. You got to take the long view. Everybody say the long view. Amen. All right. So positive thinkers say, you know what? I'm going to do something today that's going to benefit me then. I'm going to do something now. I'm going to, I'm going to sow now. I'm going to reap then harvest then but I am gonna do something now to make it happen I'm gonna read for 20 minutes a day I'm gonna read that 20 pages I'm gonna prepare I'm gonna watch a teaching video on YouTube I'm gonna do something today towards my goal and everybody said amen. amen all right so we are constantly becoming what God has intended us to be that's it. You know, I think about uh, in the Bible where it said uh, the person that came down for wanted to be healed mm -hmm. said that they were healed as they went. Yes. And when we have a, a prayer line up here, the Holy Spirit showed me is that each time someone comes for healing, their body is being, if it's not healed then, it is a progressive work. And so the same thing with what you were teaching. Yeah. It's progressive that we're building one block upon That's the good. next block. Yes. And every time we say no to our flesh, we win. Yes. Amen. Come on, let's whoop, just say whoop. no one time. No, no flesh. <laughs> one more time. 
no, no flesh because every time you say no and we don't give in, we are becoming the person that we desire to be. That's it exactly. So well said. Because the flesh wants you to just stay comfortable. The flesh wants the path of least resistance. The flesh doesn't care about achieving. The flesh just doesn't want any aggravation, any pain, any discomfort, but doesn't like challenge. But achievers are willing to wage the war. Achievers are willing to do what's necessary. The achievers are willing to get out of the comfort zone into the achievement zone to see something exciting happen. Amen. All right, let's look at week three. Here we go. Say, I'm a visionary. I'm a visionary. You are a visionary. In these last days, saith the Lord, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And upon your sons and your daughters, I will pour out my flesh and they will... Pour, <laughs> what did I... No, not flesh. No, no, not flesh. <laughs> of my spirit on all flesh. That's what, how it goes. Yeah. I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. In the last days, saith the Lord, <laughs> I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Yes. We already got enough flesh. He doesn't need to give us any more of that. <laughs> on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men will have visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And so we're visionaries. God is dropping vision into our hearts, dreams into our hearts. So simply by definition of these last days, the Spirit being poured out, you are a visionary. How many of y'all would say, you don't have to call it out or anything, but just say, I have a vision, I have a dream, I see something bigger than what the right now is, my tomorrow looks bigger than today. Yeah, praise the Lord, that's good. So... It's essential for our happiness. It's essential for a fulfilled life that we pursue the fulfillment of our visions. To have it sit in the, on the inside of us and just kind of go nowhere, that's frustrating. But to see that vision come to pass is one of the most exciting things in your life. Hallelujah. Amen. Isn't it exciting to see the teen zone come to pass? Hallelujah. That's one of the most exciting things ever. Right now, we just started on Cafe Rico. They pulled up the carpet today. Isn't that exciting? Glory to God. Oh, man. It's exciting to see things come to pass. So the Lord said, whatsoever things you desire, and every one of us has desires of God in our heart, believe for them. Believe and receive. Everybody say, believe and receive. Believe and receive. Don't deny your desires. Believe for them. Receive them. God wants you to have them. They came from God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So visions and dreams have the power to pull us into the future. That is key. And this is one of the biggest yeah. keys about vision and dreams. As a visionary, which is what you are, as a visionary, the future is always pulling you forward. You are always getting pulled into your future. There are mindsets that pull us backwards. Right. Negative mindsets, yesterday mindsets, defeated mindsets, and you're always getting pulled in the wrong direction of the I can't or I'm, you know, back in the yesterdays of life. But visionaries always have a forward thinking mindset. I'm going that way. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm Amen. going forward. Glory to God. Do you feel like the future is pulling on your life? That you're you got something to look forward to. You're hungry for it. You're excited about it. You're passionate about it. Well, visionaries are being pulled into the futures. Uh, Deb, read that quote by Jim Rohn. It's so good. And then I'll read the Steve Jobs quote, the one in the box. Dreams are a projection of the life we wish to lead. Therefore, when we allow them to pull us. Everybody say pull us. Pull us. Yeah. Our dreams unleash a creative force. Now, that's key. Your dreams will produce in you a creative force where it may look, you know, impossible for it to happen because the Holy Spirit lives on the inside. 
all of a sudden he will start putting piece A, piece B, piece C together, and then you end up with knowing what your next step should be. Mm -hmm. You end up with a, with a plan. The Bible says God orders the steps of a righteous man, so we have to believe that he is ordering the steps of my thought life as well as my natural steps. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right, let's continue. So they pull us, our dreams unleash a creative force that can overpower all the obstacles hindering the attainment of our objective. A fuzzy future has little pull power. A dream must be well-defined. Amen. No fuzzy futures. Amen? Amen. What that means is you are in your prayer life, thought life, in your faith life, there's more in front of you than what is behind you. Amen. You've got that thing that you're leaning into. They talk about uh, track racers, you know, and, and when you're running on track, you're leaning forward to hand the baton off to the next person that's going to take the baton and run and finish the race. And you're leaning into it. You don't lean backwards when you're running track race. You're not looking at the sky. You're looking forward, leaning into it. And that's the way we should be living our lives. Leaning into our dreams. Leaning into our future. Amen. Uh, Steve Jobs says, if you're working on something exciting that you really care about, you don't have to be pushed. The vision pulls you. Amen. That's why you're here tonight. That's why you're here on a Monday night. Because you're people of vision. Because you're looking forward to something. Uh, you wouldn't be here if you weren't a goal setter and if you weren't a dream achiever. You wouldn't take the time. You're here because you are part of the 3% on the planet that have a forward-thinking mindset. You're leaning forward. Glory to Give God. Give yourself a hand. Hallelujah. Yay. Visionaries are forward thinkers. Forward thinker, forward thinking is the process of anticipating the future to improve strategies and decisions. This can be contrasted with a failure of imagination whereby people expect things to stay the same. Say not me. Not or me. resistance to change whereby people seek to prevent change as opposing to leading it. No. Jim Rohn said if you don't like where you're at, change. You're not a tree. Isn't it great to be a human? We're not stuck, glory to God. A goose can only fly south in the winter. He'll never fly north. He can only fly south because that's what geese do. But you're not a goose. You can go any direction God leads you. You, you don't have to go south. You can go in any direction the Holy Spirit leads you in your life. You can be as creative and as forward-thinking and powerful in your life as you desire to be. All Glory right. to God. Let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. So here I am. I got a big smile, yeah. curly hair. <laughs> I speak by faith, that long hair. Yeah. Amen? I got, I got to just adjust this a little bit. <laughs> There he we, loves short yeah, hair. There we are. There we go. Now we're smiling. I came home with it really short, and boy, did his eyes I light I said, up. I like that. All right. So here is one where I want to be, out right? Of way. This is my vision. This is my happy place. Let's yeah. say it that way, okay? Yes. When you know you're doing what God's called you to do, it's a happy place. Doesn't mean it doesn't have frustration. But it's, it brings joy to you, right? Yeah. So this is my happy place. And we're going to see smiley faces, smiley faces, just all over the place. Yeah. Okay. So here I am. So vision pulls me. Okay. So here, here is what God is saying about me. Here is what God has planned for me. All right. And so if we're walking and believing God, this here should pull me in that direction. Amen? All right. So now, if we're really honest, we get pulled a little bit, and then sometimes we back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. We get frustrated, discouraged. Are we real? Amen. 
and then we make some more progress. We get away with that, and then we deal with it again. It is a cycle of becoming, okay? But my question is, what can we declare about the vision or the process that will continue even though I've backed up, even though it seems like I'm on the shelf, even though it may seem I'm stuck in an area, what can we declare about the vision that will take all of this and all the frowny faces and turn them into smiley faces, okay? So what is it that we can declare when we're in this process, because this is life, when, you know, uh, Think about the project of the teen zone. There was a lot of victories, but I got to tell you, there was a lot of pressing and birthing and keeping our mouths shut and declaring and waiting and believing. So I'm just, just throwing, there is no wrong. But what could we declare about this vision, okay? If the vision pulls me, that means that vision has got to have some depth. It has to have some roots. It's not just a thought in our head that, ah, oh, maybe, ah. Oh. No, it is. If I don't do this, I will stand before God, da, 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 da. Okay? So, come on, let's throw out some things that we can say to encourage other people that, hey, don't give up here. Because you will get here if you stay the path. Okay? Okay? Throw some stuff out. Push. Who said that? Ashley. Yay. Push, girl. Push. Wow, what? I love that. Yes. Declare. 2911, Jer Jeremiah 2911. Okay. Now, this is, your, this is your weapon, okay? This is so important. So, Jeremiah 2911. Okay, Rhea? Momentum. momentum. Renew your momentum. All right. How do you do that? Amen. Okay. So, let you me borrow, right? let me no, let me borrow for one second. I got to finish moment to momentum. <laughs> momentum. <laughs> it's not moment, it's momentum. momentum. <laughs> now now remember your your uh, confession is positive. It is personal. And it is present tense. So, when you address your vision, you address it as it is now. Call right. the things that are not as though they are. So you say, I am whatever you'd fill in the blank with. So if you want to be a, a certain salary, certain position in your business, certain this, certain that, you say, I am it, and as if you already are it. Come on. So you make it positive by saying, I am. Not I hope to be, or maybe I will, but no, you say, I am. So if you want to raise, you say, I have X dollars by May <laughs> 2022. I have it. Praise the Lord. Amen. Positive, personal, present tense. And it, and it works. Can I share a story about us? Yes, okay. sure. Just being We're real. an open book. We're an, this works. And we got this years and years and years ago from Brian Tracy. Uh, Jamie was working. It's not a place that you know. Jamie was working at a place and... You know, he was getting paid, paid, it wasn't well, couldn't sustain us, but he was getting paid. But we were listening. What is the, the name of that CD, that tape series you have in your car? I don't know if it was that one. Oh, I yes, it from was Jim that. Yeah, it was that. Brian Tracy, the, Achievers. Oh, the Psychology of Achievement. Okay. Yeah. So we, at that time, it was so long ago, they had cassette tapes in cars. Remember that? Yes. And so anyhow, so every day, 
you know, we're no different now than what we were then. We listened in the car. We were taught every day. But he talked about, you know, uh, declaring if you're not where you want to be, declaring where you want, where you desire to be. And so he, he, we were just declaring a 50% raise. Who does that? But that's what we were declaring, a 50% raise. He got called into the okay, office. Okay, now, now i got to tell a story now. Okay. This is my story. <laughs> no, i got to tell a story now. This is my story. <laughs> i got to tell a story now. So I, got, so I got called into the office, and uh, the big boss, and he, he said, uh, Jamie, you've been working with us for a period of time now. I said, yes, sir. He says, I'm not paying you enough. I said, <laughs> praise the Lord. He said, this, this is what I'm going to do immediately, effectively, effectively, immediately. I'm going to double your salary. Double your salary. It is the honest God truth, and it happened because of this. Hallelujah. And God put, you know, when you let God do it for you, mm -hmm. you know where we mess up is, is we go in and we try to be the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But Jamie let God do that for him, mm -hmm. and that wasn't the last time. But hallelujah, you know, we just trusted God, and God yeah. came through, didn't he? Yes, yes. So see? Positive, personal, and what you want to do, I am, I am, I have, I, I am currently doing. And so I want to encourage you, don't get stuck right here because that's where the enemy discourages us. You get stuck in the middle. But, man, find somebody that will help you push. Come on, say push. Push. Push because you have to push through. You know, they were pulling up the carpet today, and I'm sure they had, I guess they had machines, and I know that wasn't easy pulling up that carpet, but praise God, they didn't stop. They got the job done, and that's what we want in our lives. Holy Ghost, Jeremiah 29, 11, we are in total, come on, say total. Total. We are in total agreement with your plan and your timing. Amen. Amen. But don't let us be, don't let our mouths, our words, be what hinders Jeremiah 29, 11. That's right. Yeah, praise the yeah, Lord. Yeah, that was my story. That was good. I know, but I had to get in on the exciting part. Glory to God. All right. Personal development and dream achieving go hand in hand. It's part of the becoming process. You are going to become the kind of person that achieves the dream that you have. That's right. It's a becoming process. So at the bottom of page one, personal development to become a dream achiever, our desire should be, I want to transform. Lord, make me into the person that achieves this dream, that achieves my goals. It's a part of transforming and renewing your mind and transforming your life. Now, one of the great testimonies by Jim Rohn is his early conversation that he had with his mentor, Earl Schof. You remember Jim Rohn, he was a farm boy raised on the farm. His skill was milking cows. And uh, 19, he went to a year of college, dropped out of college, thinking he knew everything he needed to knew. Uh, no, and then he just started to get into a deeper and deeper and deeper hole in life. And so... At age 26, he was introduced to this um, uh, businessman. He was a millionaire, and, and he thought, I would be, I'd give anything to be like Earl Schof. And somebody said, well, he's very easy to talk to. You should talk to him. And so Earl Schof just took him under his wing. And this is one of the early conversations that they have. Jim said, well, I'm on page two. You can follow along with me. Let me give you a scenario for setting your goals. When I was making my first list, Mr. Schof said, Mr. Rome, it looks like we're going to be together for a while. I've got a suggestion for you. You're a 25-year-old American male. Sure, you've made some mistakes, but now you're on the road to better things. Everybody said amen. amen. Been there, done that. 
You've got the motivation to make a difference. This is America. The possibilities are endless. Why don't you set a goal of becoming a millionaire? Millionaire, that's got a nice ring to it. As he was about to explain why becoming a millionaire was a worthy goal, I thought, the man doesn't need to teach me why. It would be great to have a million dollars. But he had a reason that was infinitely more compelling than mine. It's one of the greatest lessons I've ever learned, and I'm about to share it with you. Here's what Mr. Schof said. Set a goal of becoming a millionaire for what it will make of you to achieve it. Amen. Set a goal that will make you reach for the stars. What a great reason for setting goals. And here's why. The greatest value in life is not what you obtain. The greatest value in life is what you become along the way. Amen. The question to ask on the job is not, what am I getting here? A much more powerful question is, what am I becoming here? It's not what you get that makes you valuable. It's what you become along the way that makes you valuable. You see, this is a whole new way to look at things. You can look at it as, what am I getting out of this? Or you can look at it as, what am I becoming through this process? Pursue vision for what it will make of you to achieve it. You see, dream achievement and personal development go hand in hand. You cannot ignore who you're becoming while you're going after your dream because if you pay more attention to who you're becoming the dream automatically comes it just comes with who you're becoming why because you're going to attract it you're going to pull it into your life by who you're becoming uh, Jim Rohn said one time he said you don't pursue success you attract success Success like a magnet. Success is something that you pull into your life, you attract into your life. You don't have to run after it. It'll come to you by becoming an attractive magnetic personality or person. Amen. Refuse to focus on any negative statement about yourself. A healthy self-image is essential when you're talking about personal development. So many people have said so many negative things about ourselves that we start to repeat them to ourselves. We start to agree with them. We start to repeat them. We start to say, I can't. I never will. It'll never happen for me. I, it, nothing's ever going to change for me. I'm not smart enough, good enough, this and that and that and that. That is not true. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. That's not and, true. And if you have the commitment to become, I mean, true commitment, you got some deep roots, that leads you to the dream. But without the commitment, the dream is just a lofty thought. So we have got to be the, make the commitment now uh, becoming and just what you said about I am so committed to who God said I am and to what God said I can be. I don't have time for the naysayers. I don't have time for the negative because every time I give room and place and voice, it's usually our own voice, all that it is doing is it's taking me backward to who I am, not to who I desire to be. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of voices out there that are not speaking your success. And it's a lie. If anybody's going to cheer you on to victory, you have to. Yeah. Look in that mirror and say, God loves me. Look in that mirror and say, I'm an achiever. Look in that mirror and say, I'm a doer. I'm doing this thing. Glory Amen. to God. I'm leaning into my future. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, Refu go ahead and just say it. I'm leaning in. I'm, I'm a doer. I'm leaning into my I'm future. the head, not the tail. I'm yeah. above and Hallelujah. not beneath. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm right. blessed coming in. Hallelujah. I'm a magnet of favor. Glory. Come on, let's say it. I'm a magnet of favor. I'm a magnet of favor. 
Favor pulls me. Favor pulls Hallelujah. me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's read this paragraph together. Debs, will you lead us in that? At the bottom of page two. Refuse to focus on any refuse. negative Refuse. Okay, everybody, one, two, three. Let's read together. One, two, three, read. We refuse to focus on or mention any negative statement about yourself. Okay, let that soak in for a second. I refuse. I'm not listening to negative stuff. I'm not receiving negative yeah. stuff. I heard one time in, when I first got into uh, faith life, it's, someone said, your ears are not garbage cans. You don't have to let people dump junk into your brain. What you say is, I fall out of agreement with that. I don't receive that. Amen. All right, sweetie, keep that going. That is so good. All right, ready, everybody? It's the negative statements that continue to belittle your self-image. While doing this, turn your back on the failures of the past. Then concentrate on your previous successes as you bring them into the present moment. At first, this requires a conscious effort, but in time becomes a mental habit. This aids with replacing the negative thoughts with newer thoughts that lead to a greater self-image. And only you can do it. Only we can, you know, ourselves, we're the only ones that can do it because there is an inside me that nobody sees and there's an outer me that everybody sees. And in that inside, I'm going to tell you what we allow to go on in our thought life up here, it has a lot to do uh, how we function on the outside. And so we have got to take those thoughts captive. Amen. Amen. A negative self-image leads to destructive behavior. Uh, I'll give you an example on page 3 of Judas. Judas earned a fortune, 30 uh, pieces of silver, a fortune in that day. But he had to betray Jesus to get it. And as a result, he was plagued by this terrible negative feeling on the inside that was self-destructive. What do you do? What do you do? Well, he thought, I'll just give back the silver. But giving away the silver didn't change how he felt about himself. I'm a betrayer. I betrayed the Lord. I'm a betrayer. And it finally left, led to his own self-destruction. And we adopt destructive behaviors in our lives when we believe lies about ourselves. I can't. I won't. I never will. And we get those things from people, to, you know, sometimes on our inner circle. Judas was certainly in the inner circle of Jesus. Yeah, and a lot of that is we're waiting for someone else to confirm or to, Th that you is know, so good. we're waiting for someone else to say, you are all that in a bag of chips. But you know Isn't what? Isn't that the truth? We're waiting for someone else to yeah. give us value. Yeah. Jesus gave us value. The Holy <laughs> Ghost lives on the inside of us. He you called have us. He, he appointed us. Mm -hmm. He gave us gifts. Yeah. And so if, there, if we're of such value to him that he says he wants to use us, then why are we looking to someone else to say, you can do this? That's it, right if there. If nobody ever confirms us, the fact that we know on the inside of us, and, and this is how you know, if God is putting something on the inside of you, no matter what you do, no matter how many years pass, it is still there. The call, the vision, the dream, the desire, it is still there. Because man can't sift from you what God put in you. That's it. I'm going to say it again. Man cannot sift from you, cannot pull out of you what God has deposited in you because it is your DNA. It's the right way he created you to be. You are, you, you go after what you do because God has pulled you that way. He has designed you that way. Amen. Amen. That is so good. That's it right there. And so you need to affirm over yourself Amen. who you are in Christ and that you are a dream achiever, David. That's right. That is excellent. 
Thank you, David. That's excellent. Yeah, what, what happened after the Holy Spirit poured vision and dreams to them? It says they prophesied. They started speaking the vision and the dream. Glory to God. you got to prophesy that thing. Uh, all right, let's look. We're on page three. Let's look about at the well-balanced life. If you're going to develop a, an achiever's personality, one part of that is to develop a well-rounded life full of experience. And this, Debbie and I try to do this on occasion where we're exposing ourselves to um, orchestra and opera and things that we wouldn't normally go to, cultural experiences, going to the museum, going to historical places, going to the art galleries, going. You want to develop within yourself as a goal achiever, as a dream achiever, a well-rounded life. Y you can't just be the same thing over and over and over again. You've got to broaden your experience. You've got to get out a little bit. You've got to meet some folks, talk with some folks, because there are people that are essential to your goal, to your dream that you need to meet. That you got to be in their company because they've already done it. And they can speak wisdom into your life. So I'm encouraging folks to take time, dedicate time to go to symphonies and museums and art galleries and libraries and historical sites and see amazing architecture and try different kind of foods. Oh boy, I, I can't believe I put that one in there. I'm, I'm like, I grill cheese sandwiches, that's about it. But... Uh, foreign language experiences, nature trails, so on and so forth. Meet people of influence and talent and wisdom. Go to seminars that ex inspire your growth. I, one time I was invited to a men's meeting by a very, very wealthy man. And uh, he said, Jamie, you need to come down. It's down in South Florida. Some of you have heard this story. And he says, you need to come down to this men's meeting, and uh, I want to introduce you to some people. And I said, great, I'll come. And I did. And he said, I've got lunch planned for us today. I said, fantastic. And so we went to this very exclusive club. And uh, I could tell because the waiters wore jackets and had things over their arms. And so uh, little towels over their arms. And uh, we went into the back room, and there was people sitting around this kind of horseshoe thing. And the, there was a speaker that was going to address the men. And the speaker got up, and he said, uh, hey, let's go around the circle, get to know one another. Just tell me your name, you know, what you do, that sort of thing. And so he started going around the circle. And the first guy owned an NFL organization the next guy owned a baseball organization and the next guy owned a series of malls and the next guy and I'm sitting at the very end I thought Lord of mercy what what's going to happen when they get to me I thought, I'm in the wrong room what what are they going to do but that was an elevating experience to be in that room with those people glory to God because the things that I heard were so exciting. They were talking about it just common, everyday stuff. They all flew in on their jets. They're all going to fly out. But for me, it was like this was an ex a changing, life-changing experience. Glory to God. So you got to meet folks. you got to get into experiences like that. You've got to read a broad range of material. Don't just read the same thing over and over. Of course, read your Bible over and over. But, but you've got to read a broad range. You've got to read some business stuff and some history stuff and some finance stuff and, and different things. You, you should develop a library on YouTube. You can uh, program in a library of stuff to watch. I have all sorts of teaching videos on business, on finance, on a whole range of stuff in my YouTube library. So I can just go to it real quickly and, and watch it over and over again. So what I'm saying is you got to resource your life. you got to get out and live life. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, the last few days I've been hearing the word, or just the words, get back into the game of life. And I've been praying that out, get back into the game of life. And I think sometimes we, we only go so far on a pathway or we just stop. 
but I believe, I've been praying that over us, those that are attending this class, that we get back into the game of life. And when you are exposing yourself to maybe more affluent neighborhoods than what you live in, or going, just going to the car place and looking at what kind of cars are out there, not because of greed, but because that you can see, hey, you know, yeah, our old 2010 Honda gets us here, but a 2022 Honda is probably better than our 2010 Honda. But you know what it does? It, it creates a desire in you. And so I'm just saying to all of us, let's get into the game of life. Amen? Okay. We're going we're to jump ahead just a little bit to, to, the, to the big why. Okay? Let's just say, just for example, just for example, okay? Um, new car, since Debbie used the example of a car. New car, all right? Give me a why for getting a new car. Let's say, I want a new car, a 2022 car, a four-door car. No, let's make it an SUV. So 2022 SUV that is, uh, what's your favorite color? Purple. purple. A purple one. What color the interior? White, oh, purple and white, absolutely. That's the best. Okay, and uh, it's, it's got what kind of radio system? It's got, uh, what kind do we have in, in ours? What's the, no, no, what's the kind? It's on the satellite. Sirius. Sirius. S-I-R-I-U-S. Debbie tells me. Okay, and we can make a long list down there. Okay, why? Why? Why do I need that? What are the practical reasons that anybody, don't use me as a reason, but it's anybody would need that? Is greed the only reason? How about reliable transportation for my wife? How, okay, how about, uh, all right, you come, you come make notes because I'm going to start shouting them out. Okay, so how about, number one, I want my wife to be in a safe car. All right, so safety. So there's a lot of metal around her, and it has all the alarms and the radar and the safety things going on. So I want my wife, and if you have family, I want your family to be safe in this awesome car. Okay, that's number one. What's another reason? Great warranty, all right? They'll fix that thing. Anything goes wrong with it, they'll fix it. Okay, what's another one? What's that? Better mileage. That's right. New cars have better mileage. Okay? Dependability. My wife is not going to break down between here and Gainesville in the midnight hour because she's in a dependable car. Okay? What's another reason? What, hon? Janice? Oh, it pleases my heart. All right. That's a great one. That's a great one. Yeah, I feel good driving it. My wife would look good driving it. That, that's a great one. It, it would elevate my, my uh, self-confidence, maybe, my attitude about myself. Oh, okay. I know where we're going tomorrow. We're going to the dealership, Dr. David. Oh, Lord of mercy. We're talking ourselves into something here. Lord of mercy. <laughs> All right, what's another? We'll do one or two more. More people and more stuff. That's right. So we say, hey, everybody, pile in the car. We're going on a road trip. It's, it's, it's a piece of the puzzle of all the other good things that's going on. That's right. All right, one more. Any, anybody got anything else? You know, all of these things have nothing to do with greed. It has to do with safety. It has to do with uh, sensibility, warranty, and all this. Now, let's say, let's say this, um, 
this new car, 2022. Let's say this is uh, a blessing of the Lord and everything lined up and it was great price and, and God blessed me with, with just being able to get this and it wasn't a burden on my life. It, it was just something wonderful to have. Wouldn't that be a blessing? Is there anything wrong with that? If I'm not stealing from God to get this, wouldn't God want me to have this? Isn't that? All right, okay. Let's, no, but you need to repeat what you just said. I don't know what I just You're said. Not stealing from God. Yeah, I'm not stealing from God. I'm not stealing from God. But you the, know what? He's blessed because he is putting God first. Yeah, okay. Amen. Yeah, okay. Make, it, make another one, Debbie. Let's do one more because I'm going to put you in a gated community here. <laughs> Glory to God. Gated. Now we are talking. <laughs> and Debbie is the reason. <laughs> oh, wait. I got, it. I got it back. Well, here's the why over here. I wrote it on the wrong side, okay. Debs. Why? Okay, gated community. Okay. Mel, isn't it only snobby people live in gated community? You don't really need to live in a gated community. That is just for snobby, snobby folks. It's people that are ostentatious and all they care about, I'm living in a gated community. La, la. No, no. Is there a good why as to live? All right, safety. Safety. How about, is there, an, is there another one? What, what, what? Convenience? Yeah, maybe it's right next to where I work. Maybe, it, maybe it's convenient. Community? All right, maybe it's right, in my, maybe it's right in the region where well, it's close to my mom's house, close to the school I want to put my kids in, close to the dog park, close to, okay, what else? Value. Maybe that house in the gated community, God just set it aside for me. And it is somebody living in there. They want to sell quick, move north, new job. And they're just looking to give it to the preacher. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now I'm getting really specific. No generalities here. All right, what else? Is there another one? Can we think of another one? (laughs) <laughs> call before I come you're already moving into it <laughs> I love that all right <laughs> what hun activities in that community they have a great activity center and they have great amenities and it's just awesome there's somebody that'll come mow the lawn I don't have to mow the lawn anymore and there is next to a golf course I can learn how to play golf Jay? Affordable living. I'm, yes, I believe for that. That's awesome, Jay. Tony. Golf course. That's right. Right on the golf course, Tony. Walk out your back door. You're on uh, what, tea, what, what hole would you want to be on? Number one. Hole number one. Jordan Spieth won yesterday. Did you see that? Hallelujah. Okay, so is any of this outlandish? Is any of that greedy? Is any of that? But listen, we talk ourselves out of this all the time. Because we say things like, that's where rich people live. That's Rich people get to drive those kind of cars. Rich people get to live in those kind of communities. No, 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 no. Achievers drive those kind of cars. Come on. Dream achievers live in the house wherever you want to live. Live in the house that you want to live in. Glory to God. You know, we have some of our older community that we can't go and just pop in on them. And, and the reason they live in a gated community is for safety. Yeah. And, and you know, that's another, another thing. The gated community keeps the, you know, what do you call it? Those people that just come and knock oh, on solicitors. your door. Solicitors. Solicitors. You know, I had it this last week. The girl wouldn't leave. And so finally I just said, I'm shutting my door. Thank you. 
and I wanted to sell me some solar roof. And I said, we just had our roof redone, not interested, but do you know what it does? Da, 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 da. So finally, I just had to say, bye. No, thank you. And if any of y'all sell solar roofs, I'll buy one from you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it is about safety. And so that's the number one reason. But see, we have filters in our mind and filters that say, okay, that's for somebody else. That's, that's for not somebody for me. else. That's not for me. Listen, yeah. I, I want us to watch. Can I add one thing before Please. that? Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to be totally honest with oh, you guys, here we okay? Go. Here, here it goes. We go. So, here we this go. right here. Brace yourself. <laughs> Brace yourself. This right here. As, as growing up, I had no idea what that was as growing up. And today, when I look at areas where I want to be, I look back at where I was, where I grew up, how I grew up. And even today, I told myself, I will never be, I will not do, I am, I'm not what I had, I am. And so every day, you know, we, not every one of us grew up with the riches. I didn't. Family of, uh, I had seven family members. And, you know, there was a season where I could say we were blessed, but the majority of it, we were poor. But you know what? Love never changed. No matter where, where we are, what we had, love was always there. But I have determined that, you know what? I may not have known what it was like when I was a child, but I can know what it is like as an adult. And if I'm willing to work for it and I'm willing to put God first, then baby, bring on the gated community. <laughs> That's right. You all heard it here. <laughs> That's right. Tony, let's key up the, the one from uh, Jim Rohn, the five steps from average to extraordinary. Thank you, Tony. I have a very interesting subject. I call it five simple steps to go from average to fortune. Let me give you this simple little talk. How to go from average to fortune. There's five simple steps. You might like to make a note of them. Here's the first one get serious that's number one i don't know any substitute for that you've really got to get serious you don't have to be grim but you must be serious i know a guy that's got a half a dozen jokes keeping him from becoming wealthy he's not known as rich he's known as a joker which i guess is okay if that's the kind of life you want to live but it really isn't the best way to live to go from average to fortune you must get serious and you must get serious about two very important things. Number one is setting your goals and where you want to go. Designing the next five, the next 10 years is so vitally important. What do you want to do economically? Where do you want to go? What do you want to be? What would you like to have? What would you like to share? How much would you like to earn? How far would you like to go? Those are some major questions to ask. And for that all to work out like you want it to for the next five or 10 years, in my personal opinion, you've got to get serious. Then you have to get serious about another important subject. And that important subject is called personal development. Personal development is striving hard to become the kind of person that you want to be. And to become the kind of person you want to be, you've got to work at it. Ten years from now, you will surely become someone. The big question is, who? What are you becoming? And if you go to work on it now, sure enough, in a very short period of time, you can take on a new direction to become the kind of person you want to be. There's a very important question to ask, and the question is, 10 years from now, you will surely arrive. And the question is, where? So to answer the question of where you want to arrive and the kind of person you want to be, you've got to get serious. So that's point number one. To make your life worthwhile and unique, to go from average to fortune, you've got to get serious. Serious. Life is serious. The future is serious. One ancient novelist said, these are the best of times and these are the worst of times. 
And for some of those who came across this platform at the extravaganza, million dollar a year incomes, for them, it's the best of times. But I want you to know that while they're getting the diamonds and the millions, there are a lot of people around the world, for them, it is the worst of times. The best of times and the worst of times. That's called serious matter. How come such a difference from those who can reach such incredible heights and those who haven't yet found the answers for their life and their health and their future? We just have to ponder that and let that give us a note of seriousness. It's serious whether you win or lose. It's serious whether you succeed or fail. It's serious whether you've got a good future carved out for yourself or you do not have. These are serious matters. Matters of the heart are serious. Matters of income are serious. Matters of supporting your family, serious. Are you serious? Why? We've got a serious matter here to discuss. We haven't come with the latest 10 stories. We've come with a serious matter. And I want you to take on that serious tone. Now, the second point is get smart. To make your life work out worthwhile, you've got to have some ideas. You've got to have the information. So you've got to be smart. In fact, in this decade, you must be much smarter than you were in the last decade. You've got to read the books. You've got to come up with the information. When I have a chance to talk to the high school kids, that's the theme of my talk, get smart. There's nothing worse than being stupid. And if you will read the books, learn from your experiences, do all the things that you possibly can to get the information, sure enough, you'll be wiser this year than you were last year. And I've got a few techniques that I teach in my seminar on how to get smarter, keeping a journal, going to the lectures, going to the seminars, listening to the sermons, picking up ideas from other people. You just must keep up this steady process of learning. Never cease your quest for knowledge. And that's one of the key points to go from average to fortune. Get smart. This is called the possibility for life change starts with education. Don't be lazy in learning. Don't be lazy in picking up the ideas. Don't be lazy in learning from your own experience. Learning is the beginning of wealth. Learning is the beginning of life change. Some people want to start with motivation, but you don't start with motivation. Somebody says, just motivate this guy, he'll be all right. The answer is no, probably not. If a guy's an idiot, you motivate him, now you've got a motivated idiot. So education, get smart, don't miss the training class. You say, well, I've already been to one of those classes. I've already heard it. I've got a good phrase for you to take home. That's no sign you got it. Just because you've listened to those millionaire tapes one time is no sign you've got it. I'm asking you to listen to them over and over and over. I'm asking you to dedicate yourself to a new level of learning. You know, study, learn, grow, change, develop. Never let it be said you didn't learn, right? If you want to solve your problems, you've got to learn. If you want to take advantage of an opportunity, you've got to learn. Develop your own personal philosophy here. Philosophy, major determining factor in how your life works out. Each person's philosophy is like the set of the sail. The same wind blows on us all. The difference in where we arrive at the end of the week, at the end of the month, at the end of the year is not the wind that blows. But what's going to make the major difference? Each person's personal philosophy that sets a better sail, sets a better sail. So don't ask for a more favorable wind. That's like wishing something that's not going to occur. Don't ask for better seed and soil. All you got is what's available. Don't curse what you got. The key is to set a better sail and turn what you've got into the miracle of your, of your future. Don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Don't wish for less problems. Wish for more skills. And that's the reason for coming here, spending a couple of days of intense effort, taking notes, rolling up your sleeves, going to work, commit yourself to learning, so that you can get smarter for the days ahead. Now here's number three. You've got to get going. All of the things that you've learned will not do you that much good if you don't put it into an action plan. You've got to get going. In my management and leadership seminar, we teach game plans, how to put all the good things that you've learned into action. Economic action, social action, personal action how to make the changes, and how to actually do the work, how to actually function. Get going, that's the key. Some people are ever learning, but they don't put it into action. 
They don't really take the action. It's like the man who keeps bringing materials to the building site and never builds anything. He keeps bringing in the sand and the gravel and the windows and the doors and the roofing material, and he just stacks up all these supplies, but he never builds anything. See, if you do that long enough, fairly soon they'll come and take you away. You've got to do something with what you've learned. You've got to take action. You've got to get going. So that's one of the most important things to learn, how to design your days, how to design your weeks, how to design the months so that you take the proper action to get the proper return that you're looking for, whether it's economic or personal. Get going. It's a major key. You got to get going. You got to take action. The disciplines is the miracle process. And here's how to get the miracle of your future going as far as disciplines are concerned. Number one, do what you can. You might go home and set a whole new pace for yourself, and we call it cleaning up neglect. Should walk around the block, could walk around the block for your good health, don't walk around the block. See, you're on the wrong track. Should read, could read, don't read, on the wrong track. Should call, could call, don't call, on the wrong track. Could change, should change, don't change. You're on the wrong track. Letters you haven't written, conversations you haven't had with your family, somebody you should sit down with when you get back home, get that job done. Don't let neglect destroy your days, destroy your life, and destroy your future. Go back and do what you can. And if you'll do what you can, then life will give you some extraordinary things to do. We all pity the man, right? Wants to stride out of his house, go straighten out the corporation, has not yet straightened out his garage. You gotta take care of the small disciplines before life will give you a chance to handle the more complicated disciplines. Good phrase to take home. All disciplines affect each other. In fact, here's a good philosophical phrase. If you hadn't thought of it before, here it is. Everything affects everything else. It's so easy to be casual and say, well, this doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. I'm telling you, everything matters. Of course, some things matter more than others, but there isn't anything that doesn't matter. Let us not neglect. Do not neglect the smallest of disciplines and build on that foundation, and you can have everything you could possibly want. Now here's number four. You must get excited. And not just the false enthusiasm of just pure positive thinking. You've got to get excited over some very basic things. One is get excited over your ability to make yourself do the necessary things. Because discipline is major step one toward personal progress. And anytime a person wishes to, they can make major changes in their life, personally and socially and financially. It doesn't ever have to be the same after today. No telling what you could do today if you really wish to. The act of murder is a clear indication that a person in one drastic act can forever change the course of their life. It just happens to be in the negative direction. What I would ask you to do, starting today, is get excited about committing an act. An act that's positive, an act that's constructive, to make the changes in your life that you want made, and to go the direction that you want to go. So that's number four, get excited. Get excited about your potential. Human capacity is usually never the problem. Little children can learn several languages. We can learn to do the most incredible things. All we need to do is take the time to do it. So it's not a matter of capacity. It's a matter of judgment. It's a matter of excitement. It's a matter of will. And it's a matter of wanting too bad enough. So it's pretty exciting to know that any day you wish, you can change your life. Any day you pick out, you can make major changes. It doesn't ever have to be the same again. And that's exciting. Knowing that intellectually and personally, you can actually do the things that will make major changes in your life. That's number four. Excitement that runs deep is the excitement that really lasts for a lifetime. Not surface excitement. I'll tell you what's really going to serve you well, and that's the excitement you feel inside that isn't even probably expressed on the outside, the excitement that runs deep, the excitement that stirs commitment, the excitement that stirs courage. Give me the chance, and I will get the job done. That kind of excitement.
Here's number five. Number five is get away. I have found, especially in the last 15, 20 years, that there's an important thing called life balance. You've got to learn to get away. You must learn to get away and be alone. Learn to get away and reflect. Learn to get away and learn how to live as well as how to earn. How sad it would be to learn how to earn well, but not learn how to live well. You must balance your life. We teach something, especially in my staff, I teach it some, something called lifestyle. Lifestyle is how you learn to live your life. Some people have money, but they don't even know how to spend it. They have time, but they don't know how to spend it. Some people are successful, but they don't know how to spend their success. They don't know what to do with it. They don't get joy from it. Rather, they get animosity. A father takes five dollars, crushes it, and throws it at his son and says, if you need it that bad, take it. Now, it's the same five dollars, but instead of dispensing it with joy, he dispenses it with animosity. That's the difference in not knowing how to live. It's called lifestyle. Then you've got to take time to cultivate good friends. You've got to take time to be with your family. You've got to take time to be with the people who are important to you, designing your life in those respects. Get away. Take the time. Reflect on your life. Recharge your batteries. Do some growing away from your enterprise. Then when you come back to your enterprise, after you have taken this time to balance your life, you will find that on the job, working on your enterprise, things will really go much better. So those are the five simple steps to go from average to fortune. Get serious. Get smart. Get going. Get excited. And get away. I hope those points will be valuable for you as you consider them. And I want to thank you for giving me this uh, few minutes of your time. And for you giving me some of your time, I would just like to sincerely share this with you. Do not walk in front of me. I may not follow. Do not walk behind me. I may not lead. But walk beside me and be my friend. Thank you for listening. Amen. <clears throat> Isn't that good? That's the man who had one skill milking cows. And by the time he passed away, he was worth $500 million. It can happen for all of us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, in, on page three, it talks about the personality of achievers. On page four, it talks about the, uh, the big why. Let's see. No, that's on page six. But on page four, I want to, at the bottom of page four, I want to just go over very quickly uh, the laws, the mental laws of success. Now, these are things that are happening now in our lives, whether you know it or not. These things happen, good or bad. They happen. So let me just read them to you and see if it rings a bell because they're all biblically based but the business community has really run with these things, and we should as well. Use them to our advantage. They're happening anyways. Let's use them to our advantage. Number one, the law of attraction. What you focus on is what you attract. You are a living magnet. You attract into your life the people and the circumstances that are in harmony with your dominant thoughts. All right, law number two. The law of belief on page 5. What you believe becomes your reality. Whatever you believe with feeling becomes your reality. Whatever you believe with feeling, with emotion, with intensity, it becomes your reality because you always uh, act on the basis of, <coughs> excuse me, of your beliefs. And the more intensely you hold the belief, the more the belief becomes true for you. Then we have the law of direction. Your life goes in the direction of your most dominant thought. Next law, the law of repetition. Repeated practice with excellence produces skill. Re repetition builds the synoptic connections in your brain. It, it de develops a pattern of success in thinking. The law of escalation. Thoughts, positive or negative, become behavior. Behavior becomes habits. Habits become lifestyles or strongholds. 
the law of expectation. What you expect to happen will happen. Your expectations, especially about your outcomes, become your own self-fulfilling prophecies. If you expect something to happen, it usually happens. If you expect something to happen, you'll act consistent with it happening. And then there's the law of cause and effect. We call it sowing and reaping. For every action, uh, for every action or event in your life, there's a prior cause. Everything that happens to us happens for a reason, even if we don't know the reason. Success is not an accident. Failure is not an accident. They all have specific causes. Look at the little red uh, letters there. Success leaves tracks. Find a successful person. Trace his or her steps. Find out how he began. Find out how he proceeded. Follow his tracks. It's kind of like following the recipe and baking a cake. Success leaves tracks. And then there's the law of responsibility. You must accept responsibility for a situation before you can change it. To control our lives, we need to take responsibility for our lives. For any change to happen, we need to take responsibility for our thoughts, our feelings, and actions. And everybody said amen, amen. and amen. And uh, so now we go to the big why. And the why is what drives us, keeps us going towards our goals. Every goal that you have should have a why attached to it. And the why will list the benefits, and the why will also list the consequences if you don't pursue after it. If I pursue after this goal, what's the benefit that comes from that goal? Well, we did one for a car. We did one for a house in a gated community. What's the benefit to that? We came up with good reasons. What's the consequences if I don't pursue after my goal? What will I look back and will I regret not going after it? Why am I pursuing this goal? So when you write your goals down... You need to list beside this, why am I doing it? What's the benefit? Because if you don't know your why, you're not properly motivated to go after it, and you won't go after it. Remember why you started. One of the greatest days in your life is the day of disgust. When you say, I'm not doing it this way anymore. I'm not living like this anymore. Come on now. I'm not having this anymore. And Jim Rohn ran into a woman or had a board meeting with a woman that was very, very successful. He says, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. How did you end up in this boardroom? How did you end up so successful? She said, the day my life changed is when I asked my husband for $10. And he said, what do you need that for? And I decided right then I will never ask him for another cent the rest of my life. And I started taking courses and classes and attending seminars. And God started opening doors of opportunity for me. And now I make a lot of money. And I'm sitting on this board. And I've never asked him again for another cent. The day of disgust is the beginning of change. Now, I want to just close out this session in these last few minutes. And i got one more short video to play about a healthy view of money. I think to have a healthy um, personality in pursuit of your goals, character development in pursuit of your goals, you have to have a healthy view of money because your goals are going to involve some resources. And if you have the wrong view of money, then you're going to keep shutting down the possibility of going after your goals. Um, I had a young man that the church was employing out on this project. He didn't last all that long, but his first day on the job, I was introducing myself to him. I said, hey, I'm Pastor James. I'm so glad that you're here working on the job. He says, oh, you're the pastor. I said, yeah. He says, let me tell you something about pastors. I said, uh, I said, okay. And he says, you know, I think pastors should be like Jesus. I don't think pastors should be concerned about money. I don't think pastors really need to have all that they have. I don't think pastors, and he went on and on and on. And um, he says, now I'm a carpenter, and as a carpenter, I earn my living. And I deserve this and that because I put in the time and the hours. And I wanted to say, I didn't, I wanted to say, 
wasn't Jesus a carpenter? And wouldn't carpenters live like Jesus? And, but I didn't sit, get into all that with him. Um, but he had a wrong view of money. And he wanted me to have the wrong view of money. Money. Let's look at this real quickly on page uh, 7. Money is neutral. It doesn't pick favorites. It works the same for everybody. Money, number two, is simply a tool. It's like a hammer. It's like a screwdriver. It's like a tool in the hand of a righteous person. The good Samaritan used his wealth to minister to the man that had been vandalized on the street. It was a good thing that he had money to pay for the room. He had a mule to put the man on. He had the, the means to take care of him. Number three, money seeks the right environment to grow. If anybody puts money in the right environment, it will work for the person. Burying it in the backyard is not the right environment. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Number four, money will not corrupt. It will simply amplify current characteristics. If you were a miser before you hit the lottery, you're going to be a miser after you hit the lottery. If you were generous before, you're going to be generous after. If you were stingy before, you're going to be really, really stingy after. Money just amplifies characteristics. It doesn't by nature corrupt. Number five, money and resources belong to God. We are simply the stewards. The silver is His. The gold is His. We're simply His money managers. Make sure you manage His money in the manner He desires. Number six, money represents all the wonderful things that you can do with it. As a good, godly person, you can do great things with money. You can do things that glorify God with money. You can minister to a lot of people with money. Glory to God. I put down a prosperity plan for you that comes from the book, The Richest Man in Babylon. And it's, he, he lists six laws. Number one, keep a part of all you earn. Number two, put your savings to work for you. Number three, avoid debt. Number four, don't speculate on get rich quick schemes. Remember, you want the long view don't look to get rich quick. Get, look to get rich in the long view. Number five, invest in yourself. And number six, safeguard your growing fortune. Amen. You know, uh, when I go to Publix, uh, I always, you know, you can get cash when you check out. And so I'm always doing the $50, and, and uh, Jamie will look at my, my purse, and he'll say, where did you get all that money? But you know what? I always take out money every time I go to the grocery store because when God tells me to sow seed in this person or meet this need, whatever, I want the cash. I want to have the money here. And, I, and maybe some of you have been uh, bl blessed by it, but I can be talking to you, and if the Holy Ghost says, so into that person, I, will t I don't even know what I'm giving. All I know is I'm taking out all the cash that I have, and I will give it to that person because I want to be ready to be someone that sows, that lifts burdens, you know, that's what money does. Amen. In a righteous, in a righteous life, and we, we are ready to meet a need, it lifts a burden. And so that's why I want, I want to be blessed to be a blessing. And it starts with, and I'm just bold, it starts with tithing. You know, start there. And then you give increase. You know, Jamie and I give way beyond our tithe. And so and we do that because we want to be a blessing to this house and because we need to sow seed. And God says he gives seed to sow. But, you know, it could be $5, could be a dollar. Treat somebody to a hamburger. But just always have something ready to sow. Amen. So good. So good. Um, in my book, The God of More Than Enough, I go into great detail about having a godly perspective, healthy view of money. I, I'm telling you, I'm prophesying over you, God wants to meet your needs in abundance, more than enough, overflowing, because He can trust you with it. 
He knows he can get it through you, so he wants to get it to you. He can trust you. Everybody in this room is a person that God can trust with resources. Everybody say amen. Hey, on, on page number eight is a wonderful proclamation of faith concepts. And Tony, if you would key up the next video to watch, it's wonderful. Les Brown is the best. He's the best. He's the best. And great motivational thing. And then after, well, we'll, we'll just play that now, Tony. I think it's about a six-minute long video. And then I, I got some closing comments. Life is hard. See, it's hard when, when you are 49 years old, been working on a job for 17 years, and they come in and tell you you're finished and give you one week severance pay. And you got to start all over again. It's hard when you're married and raising children, and your children are crawling, and your husband dies unexpectedly. It's hard handling just the tragedies of life. It's hard when you're working on something and, and you put everything you have in it and it doesn't work out. You lose your money and other people's money. It's hard. It was rough when I lost my job and I could not find a job. It was humiliating and embarrassing borrowing money and then I couldn't pay the money back when I told them I would. That's rough, how people look at you, how they respond to you. It's very hard, it's humiliating. Here's what I discovered that happens to you in life, that you will go through things and while you're going through them, you can't understand why it's happening to you. But after you go through it and you get back and you look at it and you say, oh, now I understand why I needed that lesson. Have you ever happened to you? Raise your hand, has it ever happened to you? That, that I, did, I couldn't understand it then. But after I got through it, then I saw that that was preparing me for bigger and better things. As you go through the challenges of life and you look at it and embrace whatever comes to you, don't run from it, step toward it. Don't try and duck it like most people do. See, most people want it easy. See, if you easy come, easy what? Easy go. See, but when you Go at what you're going to deal with and you deal with the difficulties of it. When you handle those hard things close at hand, making those hard decisions right now that you don't want to make, learning those things that you don't like to do, but you know that in order for you to get where you want to go, this is one of the hoops that you have to flip through. And I'm saying to you, whatever you got to do, do it because if you don't, Life is going to whoop you until you surrender and say, okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. I cooperate. Okay, I learned. Okay. They had to wear me out a long time. So if it's hard, then do it hard. Now, you, how do you hang in there during the hard, difficult times? Les, you must have faith. You've got to believe in yourself. You've got to believe in your abilities. You've got to believe in your service, your company, your ideas unquestionably you got to have faith and that faith gives you patience that is not going to happen as quickly as you want it to happen a lot of things are going to happen that will catch you off guard and so therefore you've got to deal with and handle it as it comes and not only that but that faith and patience drives you into action you've got to keep moving and keep plugging away in the Far East, they have something that's called the Chinese bamboo tree. The Chinese bamboo tree takes five years to grow. They have to water and fertilize the ground where it is every day. And it doesn't break through the ground until the fifth year. But once it breaks through the ground, within five weeks, it grows 90 feet tall. Now the question is, does it grow 90 feet tall in five weeks or five years? The answer is obvious. It grows 90 feet tall in five years. Because at any time, had that person stopped watering and nurturing and fertilizing that dream, that bamboo tree would have died in the ground. And I can see people coming out talking to a guy. 
out there watering and fertilizing the ground that's not showing anything. Hey, what you doing? You've been out here a long time, man. And the conversation in the neighborhood is, you growing a Chinese bamboo tree, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Well, um, even Ray Charles and Stephen Wonder can see ain't nothing showing. <laughs> you know that's how people are gonna do you? So how long have you been working on this? How long have you been working on your dream? It's good. And you have nothing to show. This is all you got to show. People are gonna do that to you. And some people, ladies and gentlemen, they stop because they don't see instant results. It doesn't happen quickly. They stop. Oh, no, 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 no. You got to keep on watering your dream. And when it began to happen, they stopped laughing. They said, look, whoa, look, look here. It's, look up. Hey, man, you know, I know you could do it. Look here, you got a job here? <laughs> see, t during those hard times, we didn't know how you're going to make payroll during those times when you fell and, and, and things didn't work out. They were, they were nowhere to be found. But you know what I discovered? When you're working at your dream, somebody said, the harder the battle, the sweeter the victory. Oh, it's sweet to you. It's good to you. Why? See, when, you, when it's hard and there's a struggle, see, what you become in the process is more important than the dream. That's far more important. The kind of person you become, the character that you build, the courage that you develop, the faith that you're manifesting. Oh, it's, it's something that you get up in the morning, you look yourself in the mirror, you're a different kind of person. You walk with a different kind of spirit. People know that you know what life is, that you have embraced life. You knew it was hard, but you did it hard. Isn't that good? Amen. I didn't know they got a camera in there and got me working out that day, but, but I guess they did. Man, I, amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, it's 8.30. It's, it's time to quit. Um, this, is, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray over you and release you and let you go. Now, I've got a few more things to share for anybody that would be interested. I want to talk about... Uh, if you want to stay, if you don't, I know it's Monday night, people got places to be. I want to talk about, for about maybe 10 minutes, um, financial freedom for your children or your grandchildren, or you. Maybe, maybe you want to talk about it for you as well. But um, this is not difficult. This is math. Okay, this is just math. And if, if you would like to know how to, to lead your children or grandchildren into financial freedom, what is, somebody give me a definition of financial freedom? Living the way you want to live. <laughs> Not worrying about money. <laughs> Wouldn't that be free? Glory to God. So, I'm going to dismiss now. And if you want to stay, and Debbie, you've got a giveaway? You got a giveaway, honey? Thank you. All right. Can you allow me to take one, just to do this a special way? Is that a, this is a portfolio that Jamie and I got, and it's awesome. But I would love to sew it to Minister George. Is Hallelujah. that okay? <laughs> we love you, sir, and you are due triple honor. Love you very much. Amen. And then the other thing, and next week we have more giveaways than you can imagine, but uh, these poinsettias, or these uh, lilies are brand new. We ordered them especially for Easter. And if you would like one, I think there's 13, 14 up here. Just come up and get one. And if you see one in the hallway, you can take that one. But um, so that would be our giveaways. Praise Save the Lord. Time. Okay, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. If you want to stay and learn about financial freedom, hang out for a minute and uh, we'll go over that. It'll take about 10 minutes. And you'll be glad you did. But come and get an Easter lily if you would like one. And if you need to slip out, no problem. Feel free. It's Monday night. If you got to go, you got to go. You got to go. You got to go.
Yeah. Praise the Lord. All right, we're going to start in 32 seconds, 31 seconds, 30 seconds. Amen. Oh, more than 30, more than we have handouts? We might need to make some more handouts. Okay. All right, praise the Lord. All right, I've got a handout that I want to share with you. And um, two more if somebody didn't get one. Right there, Maria. And right here. Jose and Maria. Those lilies smell beautiful. Amen. Okay, sweetie, you want to figure out the handing out part of this? And this is going to take just a moment of explanation. Here's a stack, and, and uh, here's Why another stack. Thank you, my brother. Mary, could you help pass in this stack out too? Maybe to this middle area over here. All right. I want to talk about financial freedom because uh, things have changed tremendously in the realm of finances from when I was a kid to my age at 64 now. There are things available to younger people that were not available to me, my age group, growing up. The internet didn't come in until the late 90s and online investing that an individual could open up account didn't start till the early 2000s and so uh, that was, um, you know, I was already 40 at that point. And so the things that are available to people now are completely different than our age group growing up. And so I want our kids uh, to be able to take advantage of it. These are things that you could take advantage of as well. Debbie and I certainly have taken advantage of this. There's reasons for this thought process. Um, in our lives, we have se several sources of income. We have our uh, job, and then we have uh, maybe Social Security at some point, a pension at some point, and um, these are all good things. My father, my father um, left my mother a pension uh, he had the mindset that you work the same job for 40 years. He was part of teacher's union, and you get a pension, and that's a good thing. And my mother has lived off his pension now for 22-plus years, and uh, it's been a blessing. It's wonderful. And so, but pensions are becoming more and more difficult uh, to come across. Even in unions, pensions are becoming more difficult. Only certain people within a union qualifies to be vested with a pension. Then you have uh, Social Security, you know, you hit uh, 65 or 7 and you get benefits from Social Security and that's a good thing and, and that's a blessing. And of course you have um, a job and maybe you have a 401k with a job and, and that's all good. But the interesting thing about this, Social Security, is you put money into it all your life, but it's not really your money because the government keeps it. You don't get to pass it along. Well, your spouse gets some benefits from it, but she loses hers and gains yours. You know, it's government. <laughs> the government gets it. And when you're both gone, that's it. You don't pass anything along to family. 
And so I'm all for this, but there's restrictions to it. That's all I'm saying. There's restrictions to it. So it's, the government holds the purse strings. That's what I'm saying. And pension, uh, the company that you have your pension with holds the purse strings as well. The, um, what I want to talk to you about is the availability of money that is all yours. And you get to decide what you want to do with it. And that comes by investing. And putting your money into the atmosphere of investing means that you're taking a long-term view of, uh, of uh, meeting a goal of financial freedom. Now, this takes time. And um, when Debbie and I went into the ministry... We knew that we were not going to have a pension. <laughs> Ministers don't get pensions. And um, Social Security was, would be a blessing. Yeah, that's good. Um, ministry positions are not well. And some get paid very, very well, but generally not. And um, so I had to think of how am I going to take care of my wife in the long term? In the, I had to do something outside of my job, outside of Social Security. And so when the idea of online investing became a reality, I said, praise the Lord, what is this? And so we started looking at mutual funds. And over the course of time, we have been very diligent to invest in mutual funds. Now, I don't know a lot about stocks and investing. So Debbie's very clever with this. But I do know if you put your money in an environment for growth, it will grow in the background. You, with a mutual fund, you don't have to really even think about it at all. So, so we use Vanguard Roth IRAs. I-R-A's. And um, we just put the money in every paycheck. We put some, a portion of our money in every paycheck. And we just let time take care of it. Now, the reason that I say it's easy for your child or your grandchild to become wealthy or financially independent uh, is because they have a lot of time. At 18, now look at the handout that we just gave you. It talks about two different people. One, his name is Ben, and one, his name is Arthur. A-R-T-H-U-R. -R. Arthur. And Ben started investing a little bit every year. It amounted to $2,000 a year, which equals about $38 a week. And what I tell kids is, if you just take two hours out of your 40 hours a week and put it into investment, just two hours out of the 40 every week, put that into your investment. Now, that won't hit 38 unless they're making, uh, what's that divided by two? $16? Okay. Um, an hour, 16 an hour. Well, now people make $15 an hour. Oh, that's 19, isn't it? $19 an hour. So, well, $15 an hour, you know, that's, that's pretty normal or regular these days. And so we're getting, we're getting real close to it. But let's say instead of 38, let's say it's only 25. Let's say it's 20. It doesn't make any difference. It's something. That's all, that's all that matters. But the goal is to add up to 2,000 a year. And so Ben started when he was 19, $2,000 a year. And he only did it for how many years? Eight years? Is that what's on your chart? Eight years, I think. Eight years, okay. That's it. Then he stopped. He just stopped, but he started when he was 19 because he had an opportunity with internet in now and online investing in now. And so all he did was do it for eight years. And by the time he was done at 65, he had one million, 
uh, he had 2,288,996 dollars at a 12 percent average. Two million two hundred. If I wrote you out a check for two million two hundred eighty-eight thousand dollars, would you take it? Would that be a blessing to your life? Would that give you some financial happiness? Yeah. How much did he invest to get two million two hundred eighty-eight thousand dollars? Sixteen thousand dollars. It's math. That was the total investment, 16000 over the course of time equals $2,288,000 for a $16,000 investment. Now, I added it up and just calculated it out and said, what if he never quit? What if he kept doing the $2,000? He ends up with $3,821,000 thousand dollars 129 so if he was just living off the interest I mean the principal at five percent he'd make close to two hundred thousand dollars a year just living off the interest of it so starting young how old are you 13 okay if you're 19 and you put in sixteen thousand dollars you will have $2,288,000. Can you wait till you're 60 to get it? No, she says no. <laughs> she says, I can't wait. I've got to have my 16000 now. Okay, thank you for saying that. That illustrates my point. Because youngsters her age don't understand this at all. Everybody our age gets it, don't we? We get it. And so, if now the other part, side of the thing is Arthur, he didn't start for the first eight years, and then he started putting in 2,000 every year after that, and he ended up with far less, 1,500,000. How is that possible? Because he put in an, an investment of uh, 2,000 times all those years, let's say he put in $30,000, 38, 40, 50,000, but he still ended up with a million five hundred thousand. What happened? He started eight years too late. It's just numbers. It's just math. That's all it is. So if we can get our kids and our grandchildren to realize this point that they will be millionaires. They will be, without a doubt. They will be millionaires if we can get $16,000 sitting in an investment account for that 40 years. They're not going to do it. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, they ain't going to do it. Because when I took all my kids through high school, every high school graduation class I had, I had them take a finance class. And about zero of them became investors. In church here, I've signed up a couple of kids. I get nothing out of this at all. I've signed up a couple of our high schoolers into an investment account. It's up to them what, whether they want to keep investing. Out of my pocket, I always put in the first hundred dollars to encourage them to keep doing it. And I don't know if they do or not, but we call it the Millionaires Club. And if they want to keep it up, they'll become millionaires. But this is what I'm encouraging us as Christians to do. Because the kids can't see 60 years old, they can't visualize it. It doesn't mean anything to them right now. They want a new car when they're a teenager. They don't want the 16000 in an investment account. You can tell them all day long, I'm putting it into your future. I'm not taking it from you. I'm giving you a million dollars. What do you say? I want a car. I want a car. <laughs> You said the same thing when you were her age. 
Okay, so we have to help. We as responsible adults have to help. And I, I think it's our uh, vision then as adults, as grandpa and grandma, mom and dad, to have a vision of how am I going to get this initial investment into my child's life? Because what we think about for our children is, I got to get them into a good school. They've got to get a good job. I want to get them a car to drive around with. I've got to do, and we have this list of things that we want to do. But if you want to leave an inheritance to your children and your children's children, all it will take is a little bit of investment when they're young and when they're our age, they'll be millionaires. Millionaires. Okay. So, what? Yes. Yeah, okay. A mutual fund is a, just almost like a blind investment. And that's, that's really all that Debbie and I did. And, when, and why did we do a Roth? Yeah. The Roth is a, is a system of paying all your taxes up front. So when you draw it out when you're 60 plus years old, you're not paying taxes then. So the stock market goes up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. But on average, it always increases about 10% over anybody's lifetime. Goes up and down. Right now, um, because we're in the economy that we're in, they're down. And expenses are up. Amen? But all you're doing, because you haven't sold your stock, all you're doing is buying cheap stock. So I keep putting the same amount in. So when I put money in here, when I started out, and I put money in here, I had very little, and I bought what I could, and then the, price, the stock market goes up. Yay, yay, I'm making all this money. But the stocks are more expensive. So I'm buying, I'm same amount going in, but I'm getting less for it, but the returns are better. Oops, it just fell down here. Because I didn't sell it, I'm just now buying a lot of cheap stock, and now it goes back up, and it's worth even more, okay? Goes back down again. Now it gets cheap again, so the same amount of money buys more. And so I don't lose anything until I get, a, I don't never lose anything, until this point when I cash out my, my investment is the only time that I'm affected by what the price of the stock is at that given moment. So when you start investing, okay, when you're 18, you're going to see it go up and down and up and down and up and down. And I, I tell folks, don't worry about it. If it goes down, you're just buying cheap stock. Ultimately, it goes up like this, and that, that's where you want to be. So I'll leave this with, leave this with you. The, the best way that we can help our children to be financially secure and financially free is to get their money into something that's going to work over their lifetime. They're going to have a job, that's great, and they're going to birthdays, Christmases, all these kind of things. They're going to have a job that's great. They're going to have Social Security that's great. They're going to have a pension, maybe. That's great. But in the background of their life, if they have an interest-bearing account, that is going to pay huge dividends. And then it's their money. No one can take it away from them. And that money is something that they can leave to their children and their children's children. They get to decide what they want to do with their two and a half million dollars. It's not a matter of anybody being able to touch it. It's their money. So what I would encourage you to do, if you had a, a grandson or, or a son or something, and they're in this range of being a teenager. They're starting their financial life. They What's? Have to be 18 to open their account. They have to be 18 to open an account. And then the first thousand, you've got to put a thousand, raise a thousand. You can open it for five dollars. But then nothing happens till you get your first thousand in there. And then it takes off. And you just do it for the rest of your life. 
I say put two of your 40 hours a week into it and you will see it become incredible. When you start hit, hitting your 50s and your 60s, the money every year another 100,000 is in. Every year another 100,000 is in. That's how quickly the mo money starts multiplying in your investment account. So if the moms and the dads and the grandparents all got together and they said, hey, you know what, let's do this for Junior. Let's make sure over the next eight years there's sixteen thousand dollars in this investment account and then it's up to them what they do with after that they they'll be working young adults they can decide what they want to do but you will have made an investment that will result in two million two hundred thousand dollars or thereabouts in their lives it's going to take some strategy because I think it's just kind of everybody hands on deck. What can we do? And so the youngster says, I need a car. Mom, I need a car so bad. And you say, what you really need is a bicycle. Think about all of the leg exercise you're going to get. And instead of a car, I'm going to put it into this account. And so they don't talk to you for eight years. You know what? Is that so bad? Really? Is that such a bad thing? And uh, you'll work it out eight years later. Men fences. It'll be fine. And so, uh, so anyways, that's my spiel. The, the bottom line is this. It's math. Time plus a little equals a big return. Amen? Does that make sense to anybody? All right. If, uh, if we can help you, we do sign up people with uh, Vanguard. If we can help you do that uh, for your teenager or for you, if you want to help with that, we're happy to do it. We don't get anything out of it. We just want to help in any way that we can. Okay? God bless.